Hey, we're back again. We haven't changed our shirts. We still have the same backgrounds. I'm here in my office and Thomas Alexander, who's right over here, is off in Germany. We're about 3,000 to 4,000 miles away. And yet here we are right next to each other. We could almost be shaking hands. That's the technology we use and have, have uh, at our fingertips. And it's so good to be able to have this kind of technology. And it's so good that Thomas has agreed to come back again and unpack more of the German findings, more of the German school. What he wants to do now is he wants to take this book here. We talked about it in the last episode. We talked about Christoph Luxemburg and how that uh, when he came out, this was his doctoral thesis. Am I correct, Thomas? Uh, no, no, no. This, this he did much later. He did much later. Okay. So yeah. this is, but this is the book he's best known for. And it's his work. And the great thing yeah. about it, it's all in English. It's all in English. This is one of the few German uh, pieces of research that's in English. So you, all of you can buy it, get it, because it's going to be sold out soon. There won't be many copies left. And we want to make sure that as many people can get it, to read it, and then to uh, discuss it, especially with Muslims. And if you are Muslim, you're watching this, you're not going to like too much of what Christoph Luxemburg found. But I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to let Thomas talk about it because Thomas knows about it a lot better than I do. He is from that school. He has been unpacking it. So Thomas, help us. Help us to unpack this book. And what is it that Christoph Luxemburg found that has been so damaging uh, that he has been ostracized by scholars and certainly by Muslims? Yeah, thank you, Jay. Well, uh, the topic for today is this book in which he basically proved beyond any reasonable doubt that the Quran um, contains Aramaic words and sentences um, and which make up actually large parts of the Quran as well. So it's not just here and there, it, it, it occurs everywhere. And um, that's really the revolutionary thing because that allows us now um, to really see the Quran in a completely new, new light and, and unlock a lot of the, the secrets, which um, large parts of the Quran are not really understandable. Now, before, before you go on, Thomas, if you're saying that Luxembourg's material proves that it's written by man, why is that so damaging? And why is it we're even bringing this up? And why are people, especially Muslims, so angry? For those of you who aren't aware, 99% of all Muslims, certainly the ones on the right and the ones in the middle, probably not the liberals over here on the left, but all the other Muslims, and you'll see this when you talk to Muslims, consider the Quran to be eternal. It is an eternal book that has never been created. And you get that in chapter 85, verse 22. So the Quran makes that claim for itself. If it's eternal, uncreated, therefore it cannot have any human touch. It cannot have any human intervention or any humans who have written it. It has to have always existed. Now that claim is also internal to the Quran. That's in chapter 10, verse 15 and chapter 18, verse 20. Uh, verse 27. But more than that, the fact that no man can touch it or change it or uh, accrete it or delete it, not one word, not one letter, as Muslims have been telling us, not one word or letter can be have come, come from the pen of man, because therefore it eradicates its eternality. And then thirdly, the reason why it cannot have any changes is because it's protected by Allah himself. In chapter 15, verse 9 of the Quran, it's very clear that Allah himself protects it from any changes from any manipulations, any accretions, any deletions, any creation, no word, not even a letter can be created or, or a, a word can be created. And that's why this supposition that Luxembourg's coming up with, that this is, you can trace it back to human writings. These are writings, and many of them, as you're going to, as you're going to find, we're going to find out, are Christian writers. This completely shuts down those arguments and shuts down the claims, not only that the Quran makes, but that 99% of the Muslim world would make. Yeah, and one more thing, the Quran also claims to be written in Arabic, right? <laughs> That's also perfect something Arabic we're going to... For the Arabic people, yeah. you're right. Yeah. And of course, uh, <laughs> therefore, if it's perfect Arabic for the Arabic people in the Arabic language, that suggests, therefore, that all the words should be Arabic as well. That's a great... Thank you. That's a great <laughs> event to put on to that. All right. I think with that, uh, we can hop straight in. Here we are straight in uh, my presentation. And today we're going to look at the Syro Aramaic reading of the Quran. That's the title of Christoph Luxemburg's book. And basically, what he has done is he, Luxemburg has started with the so called dark passages in the Quran. He didn't end there, but that's where he started with. Now, what are those dark passages? Um, Luxemburg says that 
roughly 25% of the Quran cannot be understood. So if you look at the commentary, um, the tafsir, the commentary of the uh, old scholars, they cannot agree upon the meaning because it's just um, yeah, too, um, it's not understandable basically. So the words don't make any sense. So they all come up with some sort of um, uh, hypothesis what it could mean, but they cannot possibly agree. Um, so then in many cases, um, for instance, you find in the commentaries something along the lines of, uh, yeah, the commentators can't agree or only God knows. Um, so that's, those are the dark passages. And, and Christoph Luxemburg took them and then he had this seven step um, procedure that I've got here um, with which he tried to unlock uh, what was written in there. So step number one is uh, to check the, the tafsir. So that's the commentary. And in particularly with uh, Tabari, who is the most uh, or the highest regarded commentator of the Quran. Um, and just to see if there are any interpretations given, because Tabari usually he lists uh, lots of different interpretations, and then at the end he comes to like he makes he comes to a judgment himself says, um, I prefer this interpretation or that interpretation. And in those dark for those dark passages, he basically says, yeah, well there is no no right answer. I can't I can't give you an answer that we don't agree. Uh, nobody agrees. Only God knows. So he looks at some of the interpretations that Tabari gives and sees if they make more sense than what's currently uh, right, um, like in modern times understood to be um, the, the interpretation of this passage. Just for those who don't um, know, Al-Tabari is the earliest of all the tafsir as well. We don't have any yes. tafsir that predates him. Well, and his date for his death date is 923. So he is 10th century. That's 300 yeah. years after Muhammad, 300 years after the Quran supposedly was compiled in its complete form would be 632. So this is 923. You can see 300 years later. What's interesting, you have many other tafsir to come after him, Zamakshari, yeah. Sikuti, Baidawi. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But tafsir of Al-Tabari is the earliest. So that's why you. that's why he is so important as well. And I think it's also probably the most extensive, I'm pretty sure. So he was really very productive throughout his life. Um, yeah. Anyway, so step one, he checks with uh, uh, Al-Tabri. Um, but he says, uh, Luxburg says that this very rarely gives you any any results, right? So um, I mean, what happens if you, um, so with every step of, of this uh, process, whenever he's done, basically stops. And if, if he hasn't found a, um, a good answer yet he goes to the next step. So now oh. in step number two, Christoph Luxemburg then checks with the Lisan al-Arab for possible other semantic meanings. So that the, the Lisan al-Arab is a an Arabic dictionary. It's one of the oldest ones and also one of the largest ones. It was completed towards the end of the 13th century. Um, and the reasoning is that because um, Tabari didn't have a, a dictionary like this available, um, that maybe some meanings um, were known to him, so potentially some, um, you can find something in the in in this dictionary. But again, Joseph Luxemburg says that this again very rarely leads to uh, good results. It's interesting because the, the word "lisan al Arab" means tongue of Arabs, the tongue of Arabs. <laughs> so it's the very the words of Arabs. So even the word itself defines what it does. Yeah. Exactly. Now, now we come to step number three, and this is um, the first one where, where he really does something new, and that is to check for a homonymous, homonymous root in Aramaic with a different meaning. So basically, he's now looking at this word, and he no longer interprets it as an Arab word, but as an Aramaic one, and he looks, what, what can I find now? Like, does it now make sense, this, this dark passage that I'm looking at? And he says that in a significant amount of cases, this actually resulted in an improved understanding of the passage in question. But if that still doesn't work, then we go to step number four. And now he's trying or changing the diacritics, so the, the dots. So now again, now we're back to assuming it's an Arab word, but now we're trying different dots. And um, again, he says often this leads to better results. So that's what Günther Lüling did. Right. So he changed the diacritics and he found uh, better results um, than, than what's traditionally been um, 
handed down um, to us. Now, if that still doesn't lead to a good result, now we're back to assuming that it's an Aramaic word. Now, Christoph Luxemburg checks um, for an Aramaic meaning using the different diacritics that he tried in step number four. And he says this leads to countless successful results. Um, but yeah, just, sometimes just, so I, it just so I'm hearing you yes. right, just so people understand. But, so he takes the dots away from the Arabic and adds them at different places to see if yes. he get so the con so that the context would change. And if yeah. it doesn't work in Arabic, then he does the same process to the Aramaic, which also has diacritics, takes the diacritics exactly. and puts the new ones in to find if he has a that, that word will then fit in that in another context. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. That's what he's doing. Um, now, if that doesn't work, he goes on to step number six. And here, this now it gets complicated because <laughs> now he, he's trying to retranslate now the presumably Arabic word. So now he's back to assuming it's Arab. Um, so he's trying to retranslate this presumably Arab, Arabic word back into Aramaic by inferring uh, the semantics of the zero Aramaic word. So the way I understand this, and to be honest, I'm not even sure if I um, get this right. The way I understand this is he interprets this word to be Arabic, but a lost Arabic word, basically. So the meaning meaning is, is no longer known. So now he tries to use the, um, the same systematic rules that can be used to translate between related languages. And Arabic and Aramaic are both Semitic languages. They're both related. So there's sort of some method behind it, or you can um, create a method um, to sort of translate back and forth um, without knowing the actual, without learning the vocabulary, you can sort of figure out, um, yeah, this, this methodology. And that's what he's using to sort of, from this Arabic word, translating it back into an Aramaic word and looking like what's, what's the meaning of this Aramaic word. And this is what he says is the most important, most extensive and most difficult step um, of this whole process, um, but also often leads to good results when done right. And then number seven, if, if he still doesn't have anything, then he's looking into um, 10th century Syro-Aramaic lexicons. So these lexicons were originally created as a translation aid um, for Syrian translators, because what happened back then is that um, Arabic, the Arabic language was pushed as the language of science throughout throughout the Islamic world. And previously it used to be um, Syriac or Aramaic. And now all those old texts had to be translated to Arabic. So these translation aids were created and some of them have survived. And you can find some um, good Arabic definitions for Syro-Aramaic words in there. And that's uh, the last step in this process. Um, and hopefully by now, we found our correct meaning. Wow, 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 wow. I mean, just look at seven different categories. How many other people are doing this? How many people have even done two or three of these to say nothing of seven different ones? Now, let me ask you this. After going through this on all the dark passages, was he able to, un to understand every one of the 25% of the Quran that is dark passages? Yes, basically, he, he could really unlock this, this, uh, the meaning of all those passages. Everything he looked at, he found, he found something, and mostly Christian texts, actually. And it's all of those are in here? So this is, um, I think he later published more stuff, right? Um, but here are a lot of examples, lots and lots of examples. So um, <laughs> it, it, it is a very, very dense book, definitely. Okay, so is he still unpack? Is he still publishing so people can actually be able to compile all the twenty five percent that are the dark passages? Can we do that? Um, I'm not sure if he's still publishing. So I've I've found bits and pieces here and there. So he's again like in this context of the Inara people, they are often like um, he publishes little papers where he talks about um, individual topics. Um, I think that's still ongoing. Um, but yeah, so I mean, the work has isn't done yet. So he he's he's opened the door, but now people have to go through it basically. And and he, but by opening it, he already gave us really a lot. And today we're going to look at one example. It's just one example, but I hope it will give a good good idea of of how this works. 
All right. And the example we're looking at now is um, the and the example we're, lo we're looking at now are the paradise virgins as they appear in the Quran, also known as the Huris. And here we're looking at a specific uh, line which uh, comes up twice in the Quran, once in Surah 4455 and once in 5220. And here I've written sort of the classic interpretation, the way Muslims today would, would read this, this verse, and then below it what Christoph Luxemburg said about it and well for those who don't know so the paradise virgins are sort of uh the 72 virgins that, that a martyr gets when he enters paradise so actually any any holy uh, or holy person any sort of saintly person who enters paradise is is um well will get these 72 virgins in 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 the popular belief today isn't that what a shahid, if he blows himself up or kills himself or he dies in the cause of battle, chapter 47, verse 6, promises this, that in paradise, it doesn't say 72 virgins in the Quran, that comes to the traditions, but this is yeah. one of the things that would be that, that he would receive if he got to paradise? So that's what they believe, exactly. And it comes from this verse and other verses like this. Um, and, and the classic interpretation of this verse would be, and we have married them with dark, white-eyed maidens. So they would be the, the sort of people who enter paradise, the men who enter paradise. So we have married them with dark, white-eyed maidens, sometimes also translated into we've paired them with uh, dark, white-eyed maidens, something along those lines. And Christoph Luxemburg now went through this with this method methodology we just looked at, and he came to a completely different um, understanding he says it, it means we will make them comfortable under white crystalline grapes. So now the question is, is it 70, 72 virgins or 72 grapes that the white uh, people, the men in paradise? Yeah, the, poor, the poor shahids. This is what's waiting for them. 72 grapes. <laughs> oh, dear. Right, so now here's, here's the traditional reasoning again. Um, so what uh, Muslims today would tell you is, well, Huris, what well, the actual word in the Quran is Hurin, it lit literally means white eyes in Arabic. So Hur is white, or whites, it's plural, and In is eins, eyes. Uh, so it has a feminine ending, it is plural, it's white eyes. Um, so now those Huris or white eyes, they will be married with the blessed men, right? We've just seen that translation. So, and you can only marry humans. So that's an argument. Then the pronoun, the pronoun used is she, which in Arabic can only denote a person. But technically it's they, but it's a gender they. So I've, I've put on she, I've put she in here because that's something, because like, in English that they isn't gendered, right? Unlike in Arabic. And in Arabic, this uh, pronoun can only be used um, to denote women or, or girls, like about humans, basically. So it can't denote animals, can't denote objects. Has to, so it has to be a human. Then we have other verses that um, call the Huris virgins. So again, only humans can be virgins. Therefore, it has to be humans, the Quran talks about, so women in that case. Um, but then wait, um, why call them white eyes? Like, why doesn't it just say um, virgins right, or, or women? Well, the classic interpretation would be the white eyes this, this line supposed to show how beautiful they are. And now you may ask, wait a second, it, if I just remember correctly, it was translated as dark-eyed virgins, right? I can go back real quick, right? And, and we've married them with dark, white-eyed males. So, but you're saying it's white eyes. So what, how, where does this dark come in? Well, reason is that white eyes never and nowhere have ever been, um, been used to denote beauty, right? It's only blindness, right? If you, if you describe someone as white eyes, you're saying he's blind, they're not beautiful. So the way the classic interpretation goes is, well, the eyes are so large that you see a lot of white, which then underlines the dark irises. So therefore, it's white, dark-eyed maidens. Um, and that's a sign of beauty, because large eyes are beautiful. Um, but yeah, so nowhere in, in the original Arabic does it say dark. Um, so it only says white. So this dark eyes are in addition by the interpreters. 
Now, what does Christoph Luxemburg say to all of this? Um, he says that huris or hurin means crystalline grapes when read in Aramaic. And here I have to go into a bit more detail. So he says the traditional um, readers of the Quran, they've got it right with regards to hur, so that indeed means white. But in Aramaic, white can also refer to a grape, especially when we're talking about paradise, where everything is pristine and, and um, uncontaminated and clean and, and perfect in every way. So that's why when talking about paradise, you would likely use um, the word white to denote grapes, um, yeah, because those are special grapes in paradise. But even like even in regular parlance, so that you can use white in Aramaic for grapes. It's just not very common. Um, but the Quran itself, for example, um, describes the wine in paradise as white, again yeah, because everything will be clean and clear and perfect. Um, and the in in uh, Aramaic means crystalline or crystal-like or like yeah, or crystal. So we have crystalline whites, which with whites meaning grapes or crystalline grapes. So that's argument number one. Then next one. He says, without diacritics, the Arabic letters for R and Z are the same. Right? So you can see it. I've got it on the screen. You see that the Z has this one dot on top of it, um, whereas the R doesn't have it. But other than that, those are identical. Now, if we read in this sentence, uh, if we, re we read an R instead of a Z, it results in let them rest instead of let them be married. So, and now you can also see how different parts of his, his method sort of apply. So the first one, he looks at the Aramaic um, meaning. In the second case, he's changing diacritics. So this is, this is the methodology at work. Um, also, then he also goes a lot into grammar, which I'm only going to touch here because um, I think that would go too far. But he really, so Luxembourg in this example, he goes through letter by letter by letter, word by word. Uh, he looks at the grammar at everything. Um, so we'll only touch the surface here. Um, but regarding grammar, he says the word be in Arabic means with, so it's married with, but in Aramaic it's under or among, so let, let them rest among or under the grapes. Then he says, the pronoun she can refer to animals or objects in Aramaic and indeed in the Quran itself. Because in the Quran, um, there is a passage where it talks about the Pharaoh's cows and those are called she or addressed as she, right? So the Quran itself doesn't know this rule that she can only apply to a human. And so he says, so that's why this is a non-argument basically. So the, here the, the the grammatical gender of the grapes is female, so it, the she fits here. Um, now, the word interpreted as virgin, if you look it up, simply means first. Um, and it's often used to denote the first fruits. And the first fruits obviously was a very important concept back in those days, going all the way back into pagan times, and the first fruits would be sacrificed to the gods, um, but also in any agricultural society, really. And indeed, if you look at the dictionary and you look at the various meanings of this word, so it means first, that's the main definition. And the second one would be the firstborn. The third one would be the first fruits and only then comes virgins. So actually the, the virgin translation or interpretation is rarer than first fruits. <clears throat> so therefore he argues that it's grapes. Uh, yeah, and again, like this, in, in no language has white eyes ever denoted beauty anywhere, only blindness. And again, we see that also in the Quran. In Surah 1284, Jacob's eyes turn white for all of his crying. That means he turns blind and not beautiful. Okay, but if, if that didn't convince you yet, which I think make, makes a lot of sense what he's saying here, um, I've got something more. But for that, we have to Look at this guy you see on the, on the screen now. So this is Ephraim the Syrian. He lived from 306 to 373. And he's famous for writing Aramaic hymns, or hymns in Aramaic language, Christian hymns in Aramaic language. Um, a lot of them about paradise. And his 
Paradise hymns were, were extremely popular. So during his lifetime, they were translated into many different languages, and he really founded a whole new genre. So people across the, the Mediterranean they loved his work, and, and there were counters of translations and versions and variants of his, of his um, Paradise hymns. And indeed, we see that the Quran is clearly inspired by, by his writings uh, when describing Paradise. There are many, many parallels. Um, so now, he, um, Ephraim doesn't use the word furis for grapes, but he does talk a lot about grapes because in, in the ancient traditions, um, grapes were important for any garden really, but particularly for paradise. So when you would describe a garden, even one on earth, like grapes would be the most important thing. You wanted to have um, grapes and and. Uh, large grapes, lots of grapes, because that, that was a sign for a nice garden. And that's doubly important in paradise. So they were, the grapes were the prototypical fruit of paradise, if you will. And indeed, uh, the Quran describes huris like pearls still in their shell. That's, that's um, an image the Quran is using. And this is taken straight out of uh, St. Ephraim. When he describes grapes in paradise, he says they are like pearls still in their shells. And, and this makes sense for grapes, because as we just said, right, in paradise, everything is pristine, is clear, is untainted. There are no scratches, no markings of any kind, no uh, contaminations, perfect, just like pearls still in their shells. Whereas virgins, you wouldn't um, compare them to pearls in their shells. Um, that really doesn't make a lot of sense. But now we know where it comes from, because again, verbatim taken from St. Ephraim. And I think this pretty much settles the question of uh, what the Huris are. So they are indeed grapes who await the martyrs in paradise. Ooh. All right. So this was, this was not one example. And as I said, I just scratched the surface. There are a lot more arguments that uh, Luxembourg makes, particularly also grammatical ones, which I didn't go into very much. So he basically says that the Quranic interpretation, the classic interpretation has some grammatical problems. That it's, whereas his Syriac reading um, doesn't. So that's just makes, makes perfect sense. Yeah. So now that we've seen one example, um, Christoph Luxembourg obviously has, uh, did the same procedure for counters of passages in the Quran. And what happens when he does that is that a, a pattern emerges. So Christoph Luxemburg could show that many passages in the Quran were actually written in Aramaic. And it's not just individual words, but entire sentences sometimes. Um, so for the first time, these dark passages of the Quran could now be understood. And that's, as we just said, a quarter of the Quran. Um, Aramaic words were not just found in the dark passages, but he also found in passages that were so far identified as proper Arabic, so just like the one we just looked at um, with the, the Huris. And often conjunctions, articles, and syntax can only be explained using Aramaic. Um, he also found scribal errors that can only be explained by the original document being written in Aramaic script. So that's not in, uh, necessarily in the Aramaic language, but in the Aramaic script, as opposed to the Arabic script. So, for example, uh, in Aramaic, the, the letters for L and Ein are very similar looking, whereas in Arabic, they are very different. So when you find a word um, in, in, in the Quran now, where there's an L instead of an Ein, that really can't happen in when, when you write this in Arabic to begin with. But it can happen if you write it initially, if you initially write it in Aramaic and then only later transcribe it. Because um, if, if you write it a, a little bit like sloppy, um, then the reader who's transcribing it and who might not be that familiar with the language, with the Aramaic language, misinter could misinterpret it. And that's exactly what we see there. Um, and I've, I've come up with like an analogy to make this, to make this clearer. So in English or in the in the Latin script, let's say the the if you if you write it if you write on a piece of paper, um, the, if you write sloppily, then the letters for Q and G could be confused. Like they, they could could look very similar. Um, so for example, if uh, if I write uh, "Be my guest" and and I'm, I'm a bit sloppy, and somebody who reads it could read it as "Be my quest," which is 
like that, the yeah. opposite meaning, um, by just changing this one letter. But usually that doesn't happen because people read this, they are aware, right? Okay, uh, they're aware of the context. They see, okay, this probably means be my guest. Right? Like they, they have to, like they see the shape and, and in their brain immediately correct it. Mm -hmm. But what would happen now if we transcribe the same English phrase, let's say into the Greek alphabet, where the letters look completely differently, so even if you could read it, like if you, if you can read the Greek alphabet and you can read an English sentence in, in the Greek alphabet, your brain wouldn't, wouldn't correct the mistake there because the letters now for G and Q would look completely differently. Yeah. Right? So now this mistake is fixed for, for all times, now that it's transcribed into a different script. And that's what we see in, in the Quran. And that only makes sense if it was initially written using the Aramaic script. Um, so he also find, Christoph Luxberg also finds that when we take this Aramaic into account, then the Quran can be fully understood as a Christian text. We find remnants of old Syrian liturgy. We find Christian descriptions of paradise. We've just seen uh, a small part of an example in the here. Yeah. We find quotations of scripture. We find hymns. We find Christolo Christological creeds, etc. And then he, uh, he says that during the ninth century, the diacritics were added and the reading therefore fixed. And now that we move from this, what we call scriptio defectiva into scriptio plena or, or clear script. But that, that adding of those diacritics, that was an interpretive act by Muslim Arabs. Right? So they were no longer uh, the same people who wrote the Quran. They were not Christians who understood the Quran in a Christian sense. They were now Muslims who interpreted it in a Muslim way and, in, and put the diacritics to match their interpretation. Um, so one, one thing that we see when we look at those old manuscripts is that there are small discrepancies to, to what's in the Quran today. And typically that is explained by um, Muslim scholars with uh, the, the oral tradition that comes before. So what they are saying is, well, um, there was a long-standing oral tradition before the Quran was first written down. People remembered every word of the Quran. Um, so it also it wasn't really that, that big a problem that in the first manuscripts there are no diacritics because the people remember the correct uh, words. And then um, later when the diacritics were added, the, the, they were added correctly based on this oral tradition. Now, what we find is that the, the discrepancies that we have they cannot be uh, explained by an oral tradition. They can, however, be explained by, mis by a misreading of the rasm, right? By, by putting the diacritics in different, different points um, to create different words. So this is something that Marcus Gross has looked at. Um, and he gives an, one example where we have one rasm, so there's an Arab Arabic word without diacritics, which in different traditions occurs once as yayas and once as yatebaya. So that's the same, basically, this, yeah, the same word, but with different dots, right? Once yayas, once yatabaya. And what he is, argues is that they sound completely different. So this is not something you would mishear or misremember um, because they're just too different. This can only be explained by somebody coming to the text without previous knowledge yeah. and interpreting it uh, by putting diacritics on there in a certain way. Is because if he had misheard it, he, he wouldn't come to a, something that sounds so completely different. It would have sounded similar. And that's, that's it for today. Well, thank you. That's, a, that's a, an enormous chunk that you've bitten off there. Good old, our good old friend, Christoph Luxemburg, that you have introduced us to. I, and I think what I have really, and my takeaway from this, is there's a number of things that I just want to unpack and just see and and and, and see if I'm uh, hearing you correctly. His, you, you really you really want to underline Christoph Luxemburg because of not only what this suggests about the Quran that this Quran is really a lot of these is borrowings from many different lectionaries, and these lectionaries written Syro Aramaic will unpack and give us or make clear those dark passages which scholars today just don't know, don't understand. 
25% of the Quran you're talking about. What I thought was fascinating was the steps that he went to, the seven different steps, starting with the tafsir, then going to the Arab lexicons, and then going to the Aramaic Mermaic roots, and then from there moving into the diacritics and unpacking the diacritics of the Arabic, and then going to the diacritics of the Aramaic, and then going to retranslating it back into the Aramaic, followed by looking at the 10th century Syro Aramaic lexicon. Those seven different steps, who else has done that but Luxembourg? And when I stopped and you just went through each one and unpacked, and I said, goodness sakes, since when? Since when, why is it people are dismissing him then? How can he be dismissed when he did such an amazing job? Seven different categories, seven different ways of trying to get each one of these dark packages and find out what they meant. By the time he'd finished, exhausted all seven of them, he then knew what words he was looking at. He then knew what sentence he was looking at. And I, I to me, to this day, we need to have hundreds of scholars. And I'm, list, I'm talking to people who are listening to this. That's just one man has done that much. Can you imagine if we get hundreds of you who are listening and some of you are young and some of you may want to continue with this kind of work, do what Luxembourg has done. Why don't you then continue and try to do unpack the whole Quran? Because he just went to the dark passages. What about the passages that we do know? Have they? Been, do we have the right words? Do we have the right sentences? Because those need to be done as well. And what we might find is that a good bit of the Quran, a lot of it, not just the dark passages, is also from these lectionaries, these Christian lectionaries, or from the Christian hymns that Luling found, uh, from taking just taking out the diacritical marks in the Arabic. I mean, th that's seven full uh, methodology. Nobody really engaged with him at that. What you're telling me is they just dismissed him either because he was upsetting the, the, the cart, what we call that, uh, that he was upsetting the powers that be and upsetting the narrative that they're also used to, or out of fear of the repercussions of what might happen, not only to their jobs, but also to the Muslims who, who are, who, as you well know, do not like their Quran critique. And it's fascinating, if you look and you start from this premise, then that would shut down any any notion that this is an eternal word, that this is a word that is uh, a book that is uncreated. What's fascinating also is that you talk about the ninth and tenth century diacriticals. We've always I've always assumed that diacritics were finalized by the eighth century, but you're putting it back to another one to two centuries even later than that. And what what you mean by that? It's not that they were not invented. They were not invented to that late. They were started. We do have, look like the top copy, this book right up here, the top copy right. has some diacritics in it from the yeah, mid-century, 749. So diacritics were being used, but what you're saying is they were not finalized. They were not canonized. They were not standardized until the 10th century. It, it was a, a long process. Basically. It's a long process. Yeah, so they, yeah. so they started in the 8th always, century. Yeah. And I've heard Muslim after Muslim saying, no, this happened almost immediately. It happened even before the time of Uthman's death. And that to me, that I've never heard any scholars say that. So it's good to hear Luxembourg saying that. But let's get back to that last point, the oral tradition. That the oral tradition, Michael Gross confronts this, but yeah. I, to, I think that's a, fa a good way to end off on this. The, if the oral tradition were that good, then going back to what the traditions tell us, the narrative, the standard Islamic narrative tells us, why in the world did Abu Bakr in 632 to 634 had to have Zaid ibn Tabi write, write it down to begin with? Because remember, only 70 of those who had memorized it, that's oral tradition, were died in the Battle of Yamama. If 70 caused such a crisis, it had to be written down, then that shows me that oral tradition is not good enough. Secondly, remember in 652 at the Battle of Azerbaijan, Udaifa, who was up there fighting along with the Syrians and the Iraqis, who are all Muslims, they were fighting against the Azerbaijanis. They go to a mosque, they hear the recitation. This is oral tradition, the recitation, mm -hmm. different oral recitations, and they came to blows. Because this could not be the Quran. And they come, Zaifa comes down to Medina and confronts Uthman. So we're now 652. And he says, How can we have different Qurans? It's right there. Just go read it. And Al Buhari, volume number six, hadith number 510. It's right there. Read it. How can we have different Qurans? He's talking about oral tradition again. We must write it in the Qurayshi dialect so there will be no differences. Write it in one dialect. And that's what Zaid ibn Tabid was then given that job to take Hafsa's copy to rewrite it in that. Qureshi dialect, and then all the other manuscripts were burned. If you're burning, you're not burning oral tradition. 
you're burning text. <laughs> that you have to burn. You don't burn people's tongues or you don't burn their, their lungs. You're burning a script. So that shuts down this notion that there was a problem, that there's oral tradition that could unify the text. So now that he sends this text to five different cities, Mecca, Medina. I mean, this is the standard tradition. I'm, I'm the standard yeah. narrative I'm repeating to you. He sends it to five different cities, Mecca, Medina, Basra, Kufa, and way up in Syria, Damascus, which means there were no more, there was no more script that would be, that would be any different. Now everything was the Qureshi dialect. So where's the oral tradition there? Obviously, there is a problem because they couldn't read the script. As you and I well know, there's just you know, there, there are too many different variations. So then they have to start adding the dire critical marks. And that's where these start to come into play. 736, the very first one, this one right here, Abu Amir. This is the earliest one I'm pointing to. That's 736. That is good well into the 8th century. And then you get these two here, these two, the most important. So these are, this is the Huffs, this is the water. So this is 796. This is 812. This is 144 years after Muhammad. So what's this got to do with oral tradition? The idea that these are completely, these are so different. There are 5,000 differences just between these two books right here. These two, the two most popular that are used today, suggest to me that they would had nothing. They were not looking at any oral tradition. They were just putting dots where they wanted to, so it made sense. And there was nobody, when Ibn Mujahid actually chose the first seven, of which these two are not a part of, the, when he chose those first seven, did he ever look at any book? Did he ever look, did he ever use any oral tradition to decide which seven he were to choose? And if there were seven different names on seven different cho choices, what does that tell me? That means that none of them agreed. Otherwise, there would just be one. If there was an oral tradition, there would only be one that he would have, he would have not needed to choose seven. So can you see if this is just you just, the, the idiocy of these excuses that we're getting? But Christoph Luxemburg, and I, I want to really end with what you've been coming up with in this, in this episode. What he has done is even more devastating because this is not the 8th and 9th and 10th century diacritical, uh, the Ahruf and Kira'at problem. You're talking about actually the original text. You're talking about the original Quran. You're talking about the the razum, the razum that is there before the diacritical marks got all the confusion. He's going back and wants to know where that razum comes from. And he's going back doing the seven different processes to go back and see how is it we can actually interpret and understand these dark passages. The fact that he was able to do that with all the dark passages, that 25% that still today Muslim scholars can understand, should have been should be that should be all, all we should be trumpeting it on, on, on all of our, our our YouTube channels. Everybody needs to know this. All of the Quran can be understood if you just apply these seven criteria that Luxembourg applied. So why are we doing that? And why is this not taught in every university? And why aren't Muslims finding the Ur Quran? Go back to the original Quran. Go back to the archetype. Find me the archetype by using what Luxembourg did, because that archetype you could probably find if you just go to a lot of Christian monasteries and probably an awful lot of churches from the 5th and 6th century. These are really lectionaries, aren't they? These are well known to the Christian community, but and in Arabic, finally made into put into Arabic, borrowed from the Syriac, put, uh, put into Arabic, and that's where the problems began. Wow, I can just see the ramifications of that, Thomas. So this is going to have this is going to run and run and run. Thanks so much for unpacking it. Uh, you've explained it so well. This is the best I've heard of any explanation of that book and about that problem. And I hope by getting this out there to as many people as possible, I hope all of you who are watching, if you have any questions, don't ask me, ask Thomas. And write them here in the comment section. Because it's these kind, this kind of material that's going to shut down any notion that this book, the Quran, is from God, is eternal. This is not a book that is eternal. This is not a book that even comes from Muhammad. It doesn't even come from Muthman. It looks like it was a book created and borrowed from many different sources. Jewish apocrypha writings for many of the, the stories of the prophets, Christian sectarian writings for many of the stories concerning Jesus, Issa, and many lectionaries and hymns concerning what about Christ and what we're going to, I assume, what you, what, you're, what you would end with is an awful lot of this book is about Jesus, not about a man named Muhammad. Well, well done, well said. Whew, that's an awful lot to take under your belt. We're going to get an awful re a good, bit, good bit of reaction to this. But thanks so much, Thomas. This is your second episode, and already you're bringing out an enormous amount of material that we now have to digest and unpack and then use. Folks, 
do respond, get back to us. Thomas will look at them and he and I will decide which ones we want to unpack, which ones we want to answer. So do make sure that you get your voices out there. God bless you. Thanks so much, Thomas. There in Germany, me here in the United States. To all of you, over and out. Mm -hmm.